What's going on, everyone? I'm uh, John from CPC Strategy, and uh, welcome to today's uh, presentation on B2C retail branding. I uh, hope everyone's morning is off to a good start. Uh, I just want to begin today's webinar with you know a, a bit of background on on our guests and, and and kind of why we're focusing on social branding. Uh, so this is actually our first ever webinar with the retailer. Um, you know, we've done all these e-commerce focused webinars in the past from you know site search to social commerce to Google shopping and uh, not once have we ever had an actual e-commerce business owner someone you know in the actual thick of it uh, speak to you guys so it, it's funny actually uh, one day our CEO Rick uh, he, he sits like two desks away from me but uh, he just kind of waved over and, and told me about this Shopify blog post from March uh, he saw that profile of your brand and, and kind of how quickly they've been able to grow and and so partly because Eric has a really cool headshot, and uh, mostly because it, has a, it was a great opportunity to capitalize uh, on the story, uh, I reached out to Eric to see if he'd be interested in sharing on a webinar. And, and, and sure enough, here we are today, hoping you guys will uh, take a thing or two away from this. So, so full disclosure, Beerbrand is is not a CPC strategy client. Uh, it, you know, it's not like we're saying our service leads to this incredible growth. Uh, you know, this is all Eric and his team's uh, work. So, so that's kind of be, going to be the much of the conversation for today. Uh, essentially, how retailers in 2014 and beyond can think about social branding as you know as a tangible, results-driven aspect of their business, regardless of, of whether you're a million-dollar company or a 20-plus million-dollar-year company. Um, and, and and so, if you guys want to check out Beer Brand's site, um, that link is in all your chat boxes right now, as well as Eric's guide to building a brand on Reddit, uh, which the Shopify post basically emulated. So a uh, quick note about us, uh, we're a retail-focused search agency specializing in product data, product ads, the Amazon Marketplace, and PPC advertising. Uh, we actually just ran uh, a recent study asking the first place shoppers go when they know they want to buy a product, and the response was that 46% head to Amazon, about 37% head to Google, uh, and, and the rest kind of just head to random places, eBay, uh, or direct to a retail website. Um, and, and so we like to think that we focus on the channels that most directly influence uh, a retailer's digital bottom line. Uh, don't worry, the uh, webinar today is being recorded, um, and so we'll send it out to you guys next week. And the last thing is that we'll be having our live Q&A at the end, so send in your questions to the chat box uh, on the right. And so today's agenda is uh, it's pretty straightforward. Rick is going to kick things off by doing an audit of uh, really legitimate retail brands. Uh, after that, we'll switch over to Eric, and he'll share with you his experience with, with growth over the last couple of months, as well as some of, the, some of his meaningful metrics. Uh, our, the speaker on our, on our side will be Rick. Um, you'll be hearing from him, him in about a minute. Uh, he's the CEO here at CPC Strategy. And to be completely honest, he's probably my uh, my favorite speaker to have on our webinars because he's he's such a polished presenter. Uh, Rick's spoken at a number of big retail conferences on e-commerce strategy, so you can expect some some solid takeaways uh, from his portion. So so Rick, if you're ready, I'll, I'll throw it uh, over to you right now. Yes, I'm definitely ready, and thanks for the introduction, John. I'm going to be quick today. Uh, Eric is definitely the main event. I'm on the undercard, so I'm going to show my screen here and then. Uh, maximize my slides and then jump right into my portion. It should only be about five to ten minutes. And so the first slide here uh, is is really a question that I, I want you thinking about. You know, does anyone actually care about your brand? We work a lot on our brand and, and our image for our companies, uh, but oftentimes the target audience um, you're not getting traction. And there's a lot of of retailers. There's a lot of agencies. There's a lot of brands in general that um, they're in denial about whether or not people care about their brand. And so I want to show three brands today that you know are actually getting traction, and it's undeniable traction, and they're doing something right. And so I think that uh, you can definitely you know learn from some of these brands that are kind of taking off. And so brands that don't suck. The three that, that we're going to focus on today, uh, really briefly, I'm just going to do what I call a brand audit, just take a look at some of the things that they're doing well. Uh, also, John, if you could post the link, uh, I hosted my slides on cpcstrategy.com slash branding. And so I included probably six or seven links in the slides that you can check out. So well, let's jump right into the retail audits. The three companies that uh, we're going to look at are Nature Box, uh, Green Cupboards, and then I'm going to do 
just a brief overview of Beard Brand, and then the bulk of the presentation today is on Eric's side to kind of jump into their social media strategy and go into more detail about what's been working for them. So here's some key stats on NatureBox. I want to show you retailers that um, have built brands, not just for the sake of building brands, but uh, the impact of that brand building. And so NatureBox actually is, in 2013, did 25 million in revenue. They did 10 million in 2012, so their growth was 150%, which is pretty spectacular uh, when you're you know, already at 10 million in revenue. They were only founded in 2011. Their site conversion rate is 6%, which is spectacular. And their average ticket is only $25, and so they have to move a lot of inventory to get to $25 million. Um, and they have raised $10.5 million. And so I wanted to show you know, what they're spending their money on. I'm going to go into some of their technologies that they're using. And um, $10.5 million is a significant investment. And I think for a lot of smaller retailers, you can learn from a company like NatureBox, where they're investing, how they're getting such rapid growth, and then kind of pick your spot. Um, for when you use similar technologies. So this is their home page. As you can see, you'll see a trend with all three of the retailers that we audit today. Uh, photography and quality photography plays a huge role in their site. I think that that's one area that retailers can um, excel, you know, especially compared to like an Amazon, for instance, where their product pages are very consistent. Um, but they can't go into great detail in terms of you know the types of images that they show for the products. And so NatureBox, you know, if they were if Amazon was to try to represent their products on on Amazon.com, um, it would be a huge challenge. And so you'll see that theme with all the retailers today. The photography is spectacular, and they're dedicating a lot of um, inventory or space on their site to high quality images. NatureBox has 981,000 likes on Facebook, which is absolutely spectacular. And to me, that's always a mystery, right? So they came, they, they were founded in 2011. They have almost a million likes on Facebook. Uh, I, my first instinct there is always to dig in, like, what's going on here? This doesn't just happen. And so we're going to look at uh, some of the technology that they use to grow this Facebook fan page, because that, that's absolutely spectacular. There's very few brands in retail that have anywhere near that number of likes. Uh, they also, or this is just a, a product page, and so I wanted to give you a quick glimpse. And if you go to the slides, you can click through and go to, go to the product page. Uh, if you scroll down, actually, where on this individual page for the salted caramel pretzel pops, um, if you scroll down and you hit images, it's literally like 60% of the page is just taken up with these really high quality, spectacular images of the snacks. And so um, go check it out. Also, you'll see a theme both for Nature Box and Green Cupboards where they know the target audience that they're going after. And so they put dairy-free, nut-free, savory, sweet, vegan. And that might not matter to you, but they know that for their target audience, that type of information and those features are really important. Their blog is spectacular. Uh, they are consistently uploading blog posts with high quality images, high quality content, and this one in particular, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. Um, you've probably seen hundreds of people posting this on Facebook, and you may even be tired of it by now, but it's for a great cause. It represents their brand really well, and it shows their recency. To be able to update their blog with a trend like that that's going on, um, it shows that it's a brand that's alive, that's human, that's in touch with what's going on in social media, and so I think for their audience, that's probably something that they found really entertaining. Here's a technology stack. If you only remember one thing from my presentation today, remember Built With. Uh, Built With is a Chrome extension. It works similar to Ghostery. Uh, Ghostery is another one that I've used in the past, but I found Built With goes into even more detail about the site that you're on. And so what happens when you uh, have the Built With extension is you can see a lot of the technology that retailers are using on their site. And so for NatureBox, I think there was over 60 different technologies. And this really helps to give you an understanding of where they're spending that, that $10.5 million in investment. And so I just pulled out a couple here that I found interesting. The platform is Magento Enterprise. They're hosted on Cloudflare. Um, FriendBuy is the referral program. And uh, that's on the next slide I'll show you. They're actually doing a webinar with Kissmetrics um, pretty soon. I think it's on September 11th. That, um, to me, I actually hadn't heard of FriendBuy before uh, you know, putting together these slides. And they have to be playing a large role 
and uh, NatureBox growing their fan base to almost a million fans on Facebook. And so it's definitely a company that I want to learn more about. Um, Nanigans is a program that they use for Facebook. It's another uh, a technology and company that I'm not familiar with that I definitely want to learn more about because um, I would imagine that, that that's playing a role in growing the fans as well. MaxPoint is a local technology that they're using to where you can target by zip code. Um, Visual Website Optimizer is it's free in a lot of instances, and so that's not one that they're spending a lot of money on, but that helps them to increase that conversion rate to get to 6%. Um, Mandrill is a MailChimp program that they're using for email infrastructure, and then they use Google for remarketing. And so if you wanted to do you know, audits of retailers yourself, just you know, download the Built With extension. Um, I have it for Chrome, and you can see the technologies that uh, the various retailers are using. Here's the, the uh, KISS Metrics webinar with Friend Buy. Um, like I said, I haven't heard of these guys before. We're not affiliated directly with them. Uh, but to see the results for NatureBox are, is pretty spectacular on Facebook. And if you go to this link, you can register for that webinar. Uh, they also specifically call out NatureBox in the promotion of this webinar. And so I would imagine that they'll talk specifically about NatureBox. So let's jump into our next brand. Uh, the company is Etails. We're going to look. Etails actually has four individual brands. We're going to look at one of their brands, which is Green Cupboards. And the key stats for Etails, uh, they their 2013 revenue was 27 million. Um, they had over 100% growth. They were founded in 2008. They have a higher average ticket than NatureBox, $120, and then 2% conversion rate, which is probably more in the ballpark of you know what most of you are experiencing. And they're bootstrapped, and so this is a a different um, type of company. They they were able to get to actually a higher revenue than NatureBox in a, a longer amount of time. Um, but they don't have any investment, and so it just shows that you don't need a wild amount of investment to grow your e-commerce company. So let's jump into Green Cupboards. This is the home page. Once again, it's a light, airy, modern site with spectacular photography. And then these eco-traits are something that I think really speaks to how well they know their audience. And so you can actually scroll over on the website, and you can filter by eco trait. So there's organic handmade, made in the USA, sustainable packaging. And like I said before, these may not be traits that are important to you, but to their tar target audience, they are. And for instance, if I sent this to my wife, this website, I know instantly she's going to jump into these eco traits. She's going to be really interested in the site. She's going to bookmark green cupboards. And that's what you want your target audience doing. You want them feeling uh, an affinity towards your site right away. And that's difficult to do. You know, Consumers are fickle. But if you truly understand your target audience and you can speak their language and you can present your products to them in the way that they want them presented, that's how you're going to build a real brand. So this is their Facebook page. They have 21,000 likes. Uh, this is a, an example of the product page. Once again, you can see it's very clean. They have the select a size and select a color options um, to be a little bit, I, I would say, more modern. And so similar to NatureBox, the, uh, the product pages are um, the design of the product pages, I think, is pretty spectacular. Technology, Magento Enterprise, they're using Zendesk for customer support. They're hosted on TierPoint. They're using WordPress for content management. They're using uh, Snap Engage for live chat. Akamai is their CDN, and their operating system is Ubuntu. Uh, once again, if you download Built With, you can check out the technology profile, not just for green cupboards, but for uh, any website that you're on. Beard Brand, John did a, a really quick uh, introduction, and the bulk of the presentation today is going to be from Eric, where he's going to go into their social media strategy. But this is a brand that you know really came out of nowhere. And if you were to you know ask me uh, before they launched whether you know Beard Products was a large enough niche to grow to a multi-million dollar site, um, I, I would have questions about that. And so Eric's demonstrated that you can be you know green covered is niche, uh, Beard Brand is is hyper niche. There is such a specific audience, but anybody who has a beard, um, and you know, Eric will talk about their, their I think, Urban Beardsmen is the title that they give. Uh, and it's something that I think a lot of people who um, have a beard can identify with. And so they built the brand really quickly. This is the home page. Once again, you can see it's, it's beautiful imagery and photography it takes up the majority of the space on the home page. Uh, these are Eric's YouTube videos, which I think he's going to talk about briefly. But YouTube has been a huge part of their growth strategy, and, and he's the one doing the videos. And um, I don't know about the production side of things, but 
in terms of you know shooting the videos and putting his face out there. He's definitely the face of the brand. And so uh, if you go to their YouTube channel, you can see that, that there's been extensive history and time that he's put into to growing the YouTube channel. And then their story, you can go to the vision. It, it's, it's the central part of who they are. Eric tells their story. He's completely transparent about how they've grown the business. And uh, I think that for a lot of brands, that's a part that's missing. We want to know who the founders are. We want to know their story. We want to know how the company came about. And uh, you'll be surprised. I think your audience you know, will care about you individually and about your brand. And, and that's how you can personalize the brand to compete in a way that an Amazon or Walmart or Target can't. And so this is the link that John sent out earlier. It's on Reddit, uh, and it's the Beard Brand Guide to um, Building Their Brand. And Eric is completely transparent. He talks about exactly what they're doing. And so I highly recommend um, checking out the Reddit post. And with that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to John, and we're going to jump into Eric's portion of the presentation. Awesome. Th thanks a lot, Rick. Uh, I know brand branding is often considered this kind of abstract and sort of intangible uh, concern for a lot of marketing execs, and so it's really cool to see that you know really the investment really does pay off for uh, big time online retailers. Um, yeah, so I'll, as Rick said, I'll be transitioning over to our guest speaker, Eric Banholz. Now uh, he's the founder of Beard Brand and an active redditor on the Entrepreneur subreddit, and uh, and really the spokesman for for what has been dubbed the Urban Beardsman. Um, and so. He's been featured all over the place, including the New York Times, Yahoo News, uh, and Men's Journal. And, and so unlike a lot of business owners, Eric's been, been really transparent about the growth of his company. So uh, you know, it'll be great to hear how he has been able to achieve such uh, growth acceleration. And uh, yeah, as Rick pointed out, the, you know, the gift you're seeing is a compilation of snippets from uh, some of Beard Brand's many YouTube videos, uh, where you know, they have over 18,000 subscribers. So that's, that's no joke, especially for a retailer. Uh, so without further ado, Eric, I'll, uh, I'll switch over to you right now. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, can you guys see my, uh, let's see here. Should just get a pop-up right now. Yeah. Hopefully you guys can see. Yep. Great. So uh, great talk, Rick. I appreciate uh, all the kind words. I'm really excited to uh, chat with all the retailers out there. Hopefully parlay a little bit of information, a little bit of what we've learned over time into uh, what you guys are, are doing out there. Uh, it's been a fun ride for us, and uh, hope you guys love beards because you're going to see a couple of them uh, throughout this, this slideshow of mine. But a little bit deeper aspect of what Beard Brand is about, what our story is about, you know, the background of me and, and why I'm actually worthwhile to uh, listen to. I started, uh, I used to work at Merrill Lynch as a financial advisor. I uh, had, had the golden handcuffs, as they say, good paying job, um, but I was just miserable there. I was kind of tied into this, this lifestyle that I didn't really connect with, and, and when work is so much of your time, you want to part ways with that and, and really do something that you're passionate about. So I chased my passions. I quit working at Merrill Lynch, started up uh, a design business, freelance uh, graphic design business, started growing my beard out. And about eight months into my growth, I went to my first ever beard competition. And after, I don't know if you guys have ever been to a beard competition, but if you haven't, it is probably one of the most incredible times of your life. I mean, it's, it's like a beauty pageant for men, and men tend to do things a little bit differently. There's uh, booze involved, uh, costumes, and uh, a little bit of naughtiness. So I just fell in love with the community. And it was at this time, it was back in 2012, that, you know, beardsmen were typically thought of as, like, outdoorsmen or lumberjacks or um, um, vagabonds, bikers, things like that. And what I noticed was a new type of beardsman, and like they said, we've coined the term urban beardsman. And these were guys who were passionate not only about their facial hair, but also their style, their careers, and developing their own independence. So from there, I started building a community. And we started Beard Brand originally with a blog and a Tumblr page as purely a community play. And through a little bit of fortune, uh, New York Times was going to quote us in an article about beards. So we took that as an opportunity to launch an e-commerce store, totally bootstrapped uh, from the ground up. We had maybe one or two products. 
and very uh, very few sales after that article came out, but it was enough to keep us energetic and keep us motivated uh, to grow the business. So what we've been able to do with uh, we we ended up putting eight about eight thousand dollars of money between the three partners into the business, and we've grown it from essentially zero in sales to over one hundred and twenty thousand dollars per month in sales uh, within uh, a twelve month period of time. And we're uh, still looking at that rate, and in August was just our best month over. And so we're ready for uh, growth season, as we like to call it. But talking about social media, uh, I want to get into a little bit, you know, kind of tips that I want you to perceive social media as. And then specifically what we've done at Beard Brand and, and what's worked for us and really what hasn't worked for us. But when you think about social media, you know, the, the questions that you need to ask within your organization is, do you guys have the resources for active management? Are you guys going to do the things that you need to do to make sure that it's going to work? Um, do your customers expect you to be online? If you're uh, a giant engine manufacturer, diesel engine manufacturer, and you're selling to General Electric for trains, then, you know, you, you probably don't need to be on social media. But if you're working in a B2C relationship, so almost a must that you need to be on social media in some way, shape, or form. And, of course, if you're going to be on it, do you have the support within your organization? Is all of this going to work? Is it going to flow together? Are you going to be able to invest into it? Like anything in your business, social media is an investment, and it's not something that, you know, you, you pop up a Facebook page, you pop up a YouTube channel, you put a couple of posts out there, and then all of a sudden you're rolling in dough, you're rolling in cash, and everything's you know, golden rainbows. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of energy. It's a lot of investment. But it's a great opportunity for you. So what are we doing at Beard Brain? You know, our vision and our plan is to produce quality content that's searchable and, of course, related to our products, but not exclusively about our products. Uh, we are a beard care company. We sell grooming items for the beard. Uh, Rick thinks it's a niche market, but there's 30% of men out there who wear facial hair, and that's going to be, what, 30 million men out there who are potential customers for us. So we see this as a huge opportunity, but it's unknown. So what we need to do is help people understand that this product is really going to enhance their life and, and make them feel more confident about being a man uh, with a beard and uh, give them the tools they need. In addition to that, we want to be regular, so we're curating daily content. We've got to be in front of them all the time. Um, you know, going a week or going a month, that's not going to work uh, on certain platforms. And then, of course, social media is more than just curating content. It's also interacting with your community and answering any questions they have, reacting to concerns they have, complaints they have, getting engaged with conversations and uh, being visual and being real. And most importantly, uh, something for us that we've done, and I just saw this typo here, so please forgive it, but you want to own the platform. When you're on Facebook or YouTube or um, any of the platforms out there, Reddit, Twitter, like you're using someone else's property to share your work. Now, it's going to be a great way to uh, grow, and it's probably – important, if not necessary, to be on these platforms. But as the case with Facebook has been recently, they can completely shift the way you do business, and that's a huge risk for us uh, at Beard Brain. We, we are a little bit of control freaks, and we like to control what we're doing with our business. So developing our own platform to share the content is a huge priority for us moving forward. And we've done that in a way that we created a website called urbanbeardsman.com. And hopefully we can train our audience and, and shape our audience to come to that website rather than trying to find the in, information on the various social media platforms. So internally, who's doing all this work at, at Beard Brain? As I said, this is an investment. This is something that we're totally committed to doing. I personally am involved into it. Uh, I do a lot of YouTube stuff. I uh, send out all of our emails. I write all of our emails. In addition to that, I am uh, the guy on Reddit, and I'm sharing 
a lot of information, and, and I'm doing activities like this where we, we tell our story, get out there. We've got uh, our customer service talent here in house, so a team member. She's uh, an incredible individual, and, and she's the one who is curating photos on Tumblr, answering questions, and, and we just started getting into Pinterest, so sharing some pins and, and getting a little bit of presence in there. So we handle all that in house, but we also outsource a little bit of our social social media uh, management, and we. It's very important for us to partner up with companies who philosophically align with us and who are passionate. Uh, maybe not necessarily passionate about what we're doing, but they're passionate about what they're doing with their organization. And we've been really lucky to find a good organization who is on the same memorial link for us. And, and we've kind of uh, handed over the reins to them on a couple of platforms as they've asked for them and, and as they've proven that. Uh, they're capable of doing it and, and understand our brand and, and our vision and, and the way we communicate with our audience. So that company, that uh, they handle our PR efforts for us, and they also handle our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And uh, it's been a good relief to allow us to focus on, you know, building our business rather than exclusively doing social media. Um, because as you guys may know, social media is great, but if you're not actually selling anything, you're not making any money. So what has this re resulted in? As I talked about earlier, we launched our blog, our community, in February of 2012, and we launched our e-commerce store in 2013. We had a little bit of growth in 2012, but I was passively managing uh, the website as my full-time job was a graphic artist. Once we transitioned over to the store, we started developing more and more time. So a lot of this growth has been since January of 2013. So in about 18 months or a year and a half of growth, we've been able to get up to nearly 40,000 Facebook followers, 18,000 uh, followers on Tumblr. YouTube is a big channel, same size. Uh, email, we've grown 14,000. Uh, Instagram, I forgot a zero there. That is 10,000. Uh, we've been focusing on that in the past year. And then Twitter and, and Pinterest are pulling up the rear, uh, 3,500 and, and 750 uh, respectively. Now, these were all grown organically where uh, we produce good content, people share it with their friends, and they like our page. Uh, so this has been, uh, we're not out there buying likes. We're not out there uh, going to these, you know, get rich quick things. This has been a lot of hard work over a period of time. Uh, to get us there. Uh, one thing that I do mention is we have bought Facebook ads in the past, which I think will give you a little more exposure and generate a few more likes. So a little bit of dis uh, disclosure on that statement. It's not like uh, it's 100% organic. So we recently did a survey with our customers and asked them where they first found out about us. Amazingly, or, or not surprisingly, because we in, invest so much into social media, is 46% of us have found us through social media. And Google search is, is really the big breadwinner. Uh, it's almost the same numbers that Amazon and Google have, uh, surprisingly, uh, that uh, John was talking about earlier. And then from there, it's, it's going to be referrals, web ads. Other is going to be you know articles written about us or... Uh, beard competitions, things like that. Within our social media, YouTube is really our big breadwinner, and that's been a great channel for us as we've been able to tell our story and give how-to guidance on, on how to take care of our beard. So it's a great way for new people to be introduced to us as they're exploring something that's very new to them, which is growing their facial hair out. Uh, Facebook, again, we've got 40,000 followers on there. It's been a great way to uh, introduce yourself to a lot of people. Everyone and their mom literally is on Facebook, so you're going to be able to touch everyone. And then surprisingly, what most companies uh, have here for their third one uh, is not Reddit. Uh, we've been very engaged in the Reddit community, and it's been a tremendous experience for us. And Reddit is a fickle beast. For those who don't know what Reddit is, it's a website that allows you to share links. And links that are good will get upvoted uh, based on the community and what they like. Uh, but Reddit is 
Uh, they don't like being sold to. They don't like being, uh, uh, well, these are the guys that are going to be uh, using Adblock as they, they browse the Internet. And they're very skeptical of you and your motives and your efforts. So it requires you to be as authentic as you can and as real as you can and and not pull any punches. So we've, we've really done our, our best in, in being true to ourselves and, and what we're about. And, and not only that, but providing good content that is enhancing the community uh, rather than just simply trying to take from the community. So when you select your social media channels, one of the things I talked about is uh, part of your social media plan is to, of course, engage with your audience and find out where your audience is at. You can't be active on all of them uh, very successfully unless you have the resources to put into it. So this goes back to, to one of my first slides where we talked about, you know, what is your commitment to social media? How much effort are you going to be putting into it? What kind of budget are you going to be putting into it? And that's going to determine how many social media platforms that you can be on. My recommendation is it's going to be better to be active on a few rather than not active on all of them. So don't let the, the uh, I mean, every day there's a new social media platform. Don't let the, the uh, challenges of trying to be on those prevent you from being really good on a few. Um, you really need to understand the communities of each channel. They all have their own uh, ins and outs, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that on the next slide you know, kind of what to expect from the different social media platforms, how you're going to want to communicate with them, and what kind of content is going to be best. And then, um, you know, also, you know, these kind of go hand in hand, the communities of the social media platforms, but also the community of your culture. You know, how do you guys integrate? What is important to you guys? You know, we are very, uh, as, as Rick talked about, we're very design oriented, we find a lot of value in beautiful photography, we pay uh, professional photographers for our content and our articles on urbanbeardsman.com, um, we invest in a lot of photography for all of our products, we invest in video for our products. You know, being on Instagram is going to be very important for us because those communities are into photography, they're into beautiful photographs, and they're going to relate to the things that we relate to as well. So here's a beautiful list of the, the big social media channels out there. Uh, I'll go down the list, and, and, and you can read a lot of this. And this is kind of my anecdotal evidence based on interactions that I've had with the different channels and, and using them. Uh, Facebook, as you know, is, is the big guy out there. Everyone and their mom's on it. It's pretty easy to use. Uh, there's a lot of help out there. There's a lot of resources. You're going to be able to connect. There's ways to, to dive down and, and you know, fine-tune your strategy and, and really maximize it. And there's people out there who are going to be able to, to, to help you out there. Of course, with everyone being on there, the interests are very broad. So there's a chance that, that your community can and should be built on Facebook. Uh, one of the things I don't like about Facebook, personally, is how they uh, frequently shift the way that... Uh, they, they uh, share your content. So a uh, post for us may have gotten really high engagement in the past. It doesn't get the same kind of engagement. And from a business owner's perspective, that's frustrating because I'm trying to build a business with consistent information over time. So as they change things, it changes the way that I do business. And it really encourages me and enforces my uh, decision to build out Urban Beardsman on our own platform as well so that we will have that control. Instagram, which of course is owned by Facebook, uh, is a great platform uh, because it, it's done a good job of keeping the spam out simply because if you put a link on one of your pages, it doesn't link to it. So there's a, uh, it's very difficult for you to push content and push links and, and it kind of keeps the SEO people out there. Uh, I guess not the SEO people, but the uh, the black hats of the world who are just trying to spam uh, versus creating uh, white hat good SEO content. 
what I found is it's a little bit younger generation on Instagram. Both guys and girls are in there. Of course, they love photography. It's really easy to use. Uh, we're posting about one photograph a day. Uh, similar to Facebook, we're doing about one one piece of content a day on Facebook. Uh, LinkedIn is going to be great for the business-to-business -business community uh, or listeners out there. It's going to be a little bit older demographic and a little bit uh, both male and females on there. And, of course, they're going to be interested in business. I find it a little bit higher time requirement and a little bit more challenging to use than uh, Facebook and Instagram. One of the things that uh, I would really encourage you to do on LinkedIn is to get involved in the groups and the communities within the groups. Uh, you can create your own community. In the past, I've created a community that's grown to, geez, I think it's up to 40 or 50,000 followers within the digital printing world back when I was uh, in, uh, in the past life. I worked for sales. I worked sales for a company in a printing world. So that's a great way to uh, engage with that audience from a business-to-business -business perspective. Now, Pinterest is primarily driven by females, uh, all ages of females. They tend to like uh, inspirational photos, uh, improvement photos. I see a lot of, you know, how to uh, uh, bake a cake or how to do a hairstyle or how to build a wardrobe, uh, all within a, a photograph. And then, of course, a lot of products and a lot of things that will enhance their life or, or make them feel uh, better in life, make them have value in life. It's pretty easy to use. Uh, I find it's a little more time-consuming, but that, that may have to do with the fact that I'm a guy, and uh, I don't really understand the Pinterest as well as uh, my wife does, who uh, seems to be quite the expert. Uh, we're, we're given a little more push here. Uh, recently, so hopefully uh, if I do this talk again next year, I'll have a little bit more insight specifically on, on uh, how Pinterest can work for you guys. Now, Reddit is, uh, is a really cool uh, community. I encourage you guys uh, to get involved. It's, uh, the interest, I, I, I break it out to technology cats, but really it's anything. There's a subreddit for anything. So if you like, you know, the color brown, uh, I'm sure there's a subreddit for all the people that love brown. I mean, l literally anything that you can think of, there's a community built on there. It's going to be a little bit younger community. Uh, they're probably going to be in their teens, really heavily based on your teenagers and your college kids, uh, age people, and maybe a little bit younger demographics from there. It's going to be a lot of guys on there, but there's also the subreddits with women on it as well. So you can reach out and find those communities as well. But primarily speaking, it's going to be male-driven community. It's going to take a lot of time, and it's actually really difficult. It's easy to use, but it's difficult to understand uh, the ins and outs of the community. There's a lot of uh, inside jokes that go on. There's a lot of uh, kind of unwritten rules. There's a lot of acronyms. Uh, but once you get the hang of those, uh, it's a really rewarding and engaging community. Uh, we use it not only for, for a way to promote our company, but we also use it as a way to better our company and get feedback from uh, the community and get ideas and get inspiration. So it helps us in more ways than, than just us uh, pushing content out there. Tumblr has been a very easy way for us to curate content and to build a brand and an image. So with the reblogging feature, you're going to be able to uh, – simply find content that suits your, your fancy and share it. So we're posting content that is is more than just beard care. It's going to be style inspiration. It's going to be photographs of men with beards. It's going to be you know traveling the world, cool architecture. Uh, one thing that I would kind of rec recommend or uh, note out for the larger e-commerce platforms, there is uh, you may have to deal with some copyright concerns. It seems like the, uh, the Gettys of the world are going to be uh, crawling your website to see if there's any copyright infringement. And even if you're simply reblogging, uh, that can be put on the radar. So if you're uh, like a company like Zappos or Amazon or something looking at branding, you may want to make sure that you're just curating your own content on there and sharing it. Um, but if you're a smaller brand that's getting off the ground, uh, 
uh, it may be a quick and easy way to, to get out there and get get some growth going and then uh, and then make that transition over time. Um, Twitter is uh, instant messaging. It's real time. It's very broad, very general. Uh, you're able to directly communicate with your audience. Uh, the downside with that, uh, it, the downside with it being real-time information is the time requirement is high because you have to be on uh, excuse me, you have to be on Twitter when things are happening. When someone's interacting with you, when someone's having an issue, you've got to respond to them almost instantaneously for it to be effective. Uh, they expect that kind of communication. It's not going to be one of these things that you can just really put it on autopilot and get success from and get engagement from. It's a little bit challenging to use because you're limited to 140 characters. Um, and there are, like, uh, I think uh, as it's gotten more established, things like hashtags and that symbols have become more mainstream. But, um, you know, just understanding the, the community and, and how that works is a little bit uh, more challenging, I think. And then YouTube, the final one, our breadwinner, uh, which has done very well for us. It's very broad, uh, both male and female. There's a lot of opportunities out there because it is more challenging to create a video than it is to simply write a blog article. Um, there's opportunities to produce videos on great blog contents and get good traction on YouTube for it. So uh, when, when we entered on to YouTube, there's essentially no beard care uh, videos out there, and we just started producing them. Uh, not so much as a strategy for us, but something that we're just passionate with and, and sharing our information. The unfortunate side effect is it takes a lot of time to film, to edit, to upload, uh, and also to engage and, and talk with the community. And it's very difficult to use, you know, but it's, it's a, a great opportunity if you can do it. Um, but plan on spending more resources on YouTube than your other platforms. So to wrap it up, social media is really a simple thing. It's, it's simply creating content and a new way to share it, and it's a way to communicate with your audience. So think of social media as uh, the cell phone 10 years ago, as the telephone you know, 100 years ago, as the in-person meeting you know, since the dawn of time. It's a way for us to communicate with our audience in a more efficient way than has been done in the past. So I can communicate with tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands if, if uh, we grow successfully really easily, whereas before uh, we didn't have the same way to do it directly. We would have to go through an intermediary like a TV channel or, uh, excuse me, a TV commercial or a, a newspaper commercial. But now we've got the ability to do it on our own through our own blog, uh, through your own content, as well as through other platforms like Facebook and all the other ones we listed earlier. We want you, I want you to communicate and create with a purpose. Uh, it's gonna take a little bit of learning period to understand really what your community wants you to engage with. So keep your ears open, keep your eyes open, and listen to the community. Find out which ones are getting uh, more responsive feedback, post at different times when you're getting started to find out what times are your audience most engaging with you. You know, are posts on Thursday at noon the best time or, you know, Monday early morning. Like, you, the only way you're going to know which works most effectively is if you try them. So create a strategy and a purpose for generating the content and sharing the, the content. This is a big one for me. Um, I'm not selling any silver bullets out there. Our social media efforts has been hard and a lot of hard works. And I want you guys to not plan on ever having that viral content. You know, there's nothing out there where you just create it out and then all of a sudden it's blowing up and you're making millions of dollars. It's similar to keeping up with the Joneses where you see your neighbor, neighbor across the streets getting a new car, the neighbor to the right is getting a hot tub, and the neighbor to the left is, you know, putting in a new kitchen. And you as an individual thinks that everyone is winning. But the reality is they're only doing one thing, and it's only one aspect of success. 
So don't get overwhelmed with all these companies out there who seem like they're they're easily tapping into the social media world and just having all this success and it's just coming to them. It's a lot of hard work. And if you are so fortunate to have something that goes viral, be prepared to take advantage of that. Have the tools necessary to be able to engage with it, to be able to push it harder, faster, longer. Um, but if you build content that works without any kind of vir virility to it, then that's a better strategy than shooting for a home run every single time. And most importantly for us, and, and really what's worked for us, is having a voice, you know, and, and telling a story about what we do. I told our story at the beginning of this presentation, so hopefully you really got to understand what we're about and how we're trying to change the way society views beardsmen and how we're trying to give the, the tools uh, to our audience and to our customers that they need to feel confident with their beard. And people engage with the movement much more than they engage with products. Our strategy with Beard Brand and Building Beard Brand is not to have the best product out there, or have the best uh, beard oil or mustache wax, but to have the best platform to engage with them and really share the, the lifestyle and, and what it's about. And then one final uh, quick trick or a quick trick tip that I can tell you is uh, one way to really get more engagement with your community through social media is to have contests. Uh, and we found a platform called Glean, and the website's www.glean.io. is a great tool that will allow our audience to share a contest with their friends and their social media platforms. And we put on three contests with a retail value of probably about $500 of just beard oil or, or beard kits, things like that, that we sell on our website. And uh, through that, we've been able to generate about 4,500 new subscribers to our newsletter. We've gotten uh, thousands of new followers on our YouTube channel. Uh, we've gotten thousands of followers on Instagram. It's a really cost-effective way to grow your your community organically. And I highly recommend it. And the people that run it, uh, Stuart over there, he's a great guy. Uh, they're out of Australia. Um, so hopefully you can look into that. And, and if you have any more questions about it, feel free to ask them in the chat, which brings me up to my final slide. What questions you guys got for me? All right. Uh, great. Thank you, Eric. Um, definitely appreciate you uh, sharing that with us. Um, you know, it's really cool to see your breakdown of time investments involved with each channel. Um, it, you know, it definitely seems a lot more uh, manageable once you kind of divide and conquer like that. Um, so, so as Eric said, we'll be transitioning to our Q&A portion right now. So if you guys have any questions for Eric or Rick um, about the content they covered today or really anything that might pop up, uh, you know, please do submit those questions in the chat box to the right. Um, I already have a couple here, Eric. Uh, looks like they're all pretty much uh, geared towards you. Uh, so Eric Ben. Hey John. To... Hey, John, this yep. is Rick. Sorry, I just wanted to jump in there real quick before we get into the other questions. Um, I have a question for you, Eric. It seems like you know we've talked to a lot of retailers over the years, and it's very rare that a retailer is as transparent as you are. Um, most of the time, the if they're having any success, um, they want to kind of keep you know their partners quiet. They don't want to talk about their technologies. They don't want to talk about the strategies or tactics that are are working for them because there's this fear that their competition is watching their every move and is going to kind of steal their ideas from them. Um, what, what made you decide to be so transparent? It seems like it's almost been part of the business strategy from day one. So if you wouldn't mind, could you kind of take us into the thought process of, of how you've approached that transparency and how you continue to um, you know, stay so transparent with how you're, you're growing your business? Well, uh, probably one of the things is uh, I'm a bit of a chatterbox myself, and I can't keep my mouth shut. So if, if I'm going to run around telling these things, I might as well do it full force. But it really comes down to two things for us. First of all is we really have confidence in our abilities and our products. We know it's a lot of hard work to do what we're doing, and we know we've got some pretty good skill sets internally. Um, even with giving a full blueprint to our customers or our future com competitors, we know that we're going to be leading the pack. We're going to be doing things innovatively. We're going to be uh, pushing the limits of our community. Um, and we also view our industry as a, 
a growing industry. So uh, even having more competitors in the marketplace is a good thing for us because it's a great way to share the need for the product and get it out there. And, and we know when people try our products, it's, it's really going to rock their socks off. And in addition to that, the process of us sharing our story and telling our story has really given us some tremendous feedback from the community on how to better improve our, our business. If you look at what we're at today uh, versus when we launched, uh, like our, our website design and, and uh, the functionality, the flow, and the tools we're using, all those have been molded and shaped by the community. And we wouldn't have gotten any of that positive feedback and ability to grow without being fully transparent and without telling our story and, and without letting people celebrate the wins with us and celebrating the losses. So uh, the transparency has been great for us in the sense that our community is, is engaged with us and they're invested with us and, and they want to see us succeed as well. That's awesome. Thank you for that. I feel like I already had kind of an understanding of your mindset, but um, it's, it does make you feel like you want to kind of root on your brand and you want to support the brand and I think for you know someone with a beard I'd probably pay a little bit higher price for your products um, than what I could get off of, of Amazon because I want you guys to succeed and it almost it probably makes your customers feel like they're kind of part of that journey with you. Yeah and, and they really are. I, I respond to a lot of our, our customers who email us in so I've gotten to know a lot of them and, and it's been really rewarding for me personally. That's awesome. All right, I'll turn it back over to you, John, for the questions from the audience. Thanks, Eric, and uh, thanks for the good question, Rick. Uh, speaking of email, uh, yeah, Ben wants to know, uh, you know, do you guys have a newsletter, and if so, kind of what's your email marketing strategy? Uh, I guess basically what types of emails do you guys send? Yeah, our strategy, uh, this is one thing that we're, I'm, I'm really proud of. We're probably, even with our email, it's, it's the 80-20 rule or the 90-10 rule, where 80% of our stuff is, is – kind of good content, we provide um, a lot of almost, I want to say inspirational, but just kind of walking them through what's going on at Beard Brand, what we're doing, the, the, the challenges that we're facing. We try to keep it pretty short, but it's an all plain text email. And I'll write probably, you know, three or four paragraphs about what's going on in my life. Um, you know, one of my emails was uh, my recent move from Spokane to, to Washington and, and how I personally have pushed myself in, in, in my own personal comfort level and how that's going to help me grow and, and hopefully how it will help our customers and our audience grow as well and, and really help them feel aligned and connected with the community. And then from there, we'll, we'll uh, every once in a while kind of drop in when we have a new product release, but we don't do any coupon marketing. We, we kind of took a page out of Nordstrom's book where we're confident with our product. Uh, when our customers are ready to buy, uh, we'll be happy to sell it to them, but we don't want to push or pressure them and push them into buying. So we feel that uh, a more laid back approach is, is more of our style. And, you know, we're not training our customers to sit around and wait for a discount. We're training them to, you know, really feel confident with their decision. And, and uh, we know our product's good, and if they don't like it, we'll buy it back from them. So. Uh, hopefully that, that helps clarify kind of our strategy. But we do get a you know a little more details about our email marketing. We probably have anywhere between a 40 and 50 percent open rate. And depending on whether or not we're driving people to click on something or if we're just sharing information, we'll get a click rate of probably anywhere between three and, and 15 percent. Wow, that's, a, that's very cool. Um, and and and. Kind of just a, a more overarching question. Um, David wants to know, you know, when we're talking about branding, I guess how much would you say social media makes up of that overall strategy? Um, I, I guess are there other things you guys do to sculpt your brand image, uh, possibly uh, live events or, or, or even just packaging? Yeah, so uh, packaging, of course, is a big part of, you know, packaging, photography, our logo, our business cards. Branding is a big thing, so there's a lot of different avenues and, and, and ways that you need to implement. And the, the key to successful branding is to be consistent throughout all your, your channels and platforms. In terms of marketing, you know, we do market more than social media. We also do uh, PPC uh, advertisements. We buy some ads on some websites. We also put on a uh, uh, party down uh, at South by Southwest. We call it South by Beard Brand. So if you're in Austin for that, I'd love to have you swing by. 
Um, we go to trade shows, to get our product out there. We give out free samples, things like that. So there's a lot of avenues that we use for marketing beyond social media. Um, but just having that consistent look throughout the whole process is, is really important to us. Now, one thing I wanted to add is we do have a, all of our emails. Uh, you, you can have access to that, and, and I'll shoot an email to you, John, with, with my uh, PowerPoint slide as well as a list of all our emails so you can actually see what our emails say. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll share that with everyone. Um, earlier you mentioned you ran a customer survey that kind of asked, you know, how they heard of beer, how your customers heard of beer brand and, and kind of the makeup um, you know, of those sources. I, I guess from that survey, what aspects of your strategy uh, or investments like did, did you make, or I guess what changes did you make to that? So um, with that survey, I think the big thing for us was trying to figure out uh, what products they're interested in next. So we had about four, four or five questions on there. Um, and just getting a better understanding of, of where people are coming from, what terms they're searching for. But the big thing for us was trying to find other avenues to connect. What particular websites are they on? And trying to understand that in the sense that, that we may be able to, to reach out to those websites and advertise there and, and connect with them and, and build relationships. Very cool, very cool. Um, I, I, kind of a random question. Uh, Rick, this is a direct towards you, but, but Eric, you can chime in if you want. Um, who would you recommend for an SEO for a site that sells brand name products? For a site that sells brand name products? Um, there's, I mean, there's a ton of SEO vendors that are out there. It depends on if you're looking for a platform that your in-house uh, – team member can use and so if you're you know a, the, the business owner and you want to take a shot at doing some of the SEO yourself you can use a, a platform like Moz uh, most of the time you're going to pay uh, that your SEO firm somewhere between three to five thousand dollars a month and so it really depends on your budget um, portent interactive their CEO Ian Lurie is, is a great reputation in the uh, SEO community there's a, a company locally in San Diego called Thunder SEO that we have a very close relationship with, and I highly recommend them. Then also just on, on LinkedIn, you can find a lot of like sole practitioners that um, work in SEO. But I think the, the key thing with SEO, just like Eric talked about building their brand, is the consistency over time. If your expectation is that you're going to work with a, a partner that's just going to get you to rank organically in, in two to three months, and you're going to spend... $500 a month and you're going to start knocking it out of the park with your SEO, it's just not going to happen. And so you have to be consistent with your approach. Um, it's a long-term game, just like Eric referenced on social media. There's no there's no instant wins there or easy ways to get your products to rank organically. And if they're if someone's promising you that, it's because they're, they're not legitimate and they're actually going to risk your site um, to you know, get penalized by Google. And so that's a long-term process. And, and from what I've seen, the retailers that have the best success with SEO, they, they actually start on their own and they kind of learn what's working and then they find a partner that they can trust to kind of scale out those SEO efforts. What do you guys do yeah. for SEO, Eric? Um, we're working with an independent consultant right now, uh, just recently. Uh, so we haven't done any SEO up until August. So it's something new that we're, we're testing, and I want to feel comfortable recommending it until I really get a better grasp on you know, what we're looking for from our, our SEO partner and, and uh, how he's implementing it. Got it. Thanks, thanks guys. I hope that answers uh, your question. Um, back to you, Eric. I guess, I guess uh, you, you mentioned how Pinterest is kind of a challenge, um, you know, since it's a mainly female uh, social platform and, 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 you know, you sell beer care products. Um, and, and it's probably a relatable issue for retailers that send or that sell, you know, products that aren't necessarily geared toward the younger audience. Or um, I, I guess, I guess, how is uh, how have you approach Pinterest, knowing that your, you know, your target market is probably not on Pinterest? Well, I think our target audience is on Pinterest in the sense that um, there's a lot of women with beards men in their life. So part of our strategy going forward is is the gifting strategy and, and helping them understand what a great gift will be for, for their bearded husband or partner or friend or dad um, and helping them understand what it means and how it's going to work for them and 
so I think it is out there. I think it's a great opportunity for us as women tend to be a little uh, looser with their, their – or they make buying decisions a little more effectively than men or more efficiently. Okay. So, uh, but we do have probably about 93% of our customers are men. So I would like to, uh, to diversify risk a little bit with that. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, and, and the last one I have here is, um, you know, you mentioned content is, is a big thing for you, and, and you have your, your site. Is, is it urbanbeardsman.com? Yep, urbanbeardsman.com. Um, and, and so you have the content there. I guess what is your strategy for, for directing the consumer um, to that website uh, from social media platforms but, but not being too salesy once they reach that destination? I guess if you're thinking about the 80-20 rule, you know, how much is just information, how much is kind of pitch? Yeah, we uh, we create urbanbeersman.com uh, almost as a standalone magazine to function on its own, uh, and we almost think of it as an independent entity of beer brand. And uh, right now, what our strategies have been is providing profiles of of beardsmen who are inspirational or, or who are doing cool things to help kind of give people. Uh, you know, what it could be like if they had a beard and, and did jobs like that. But we also provide, like, uh, how-to guides and, and grooming, similar to what our YouTube channel is, but in a blog format. Um, but from there, we're going to, you know, create content about the lifestyle. We use our social media uh, congruently. So on Tumblr, we'll upload a photograph that's, that comes from our Urban Beardsman blog and share it with a link back to the Urban Beersman blog and, and kind of do the same thing on Facebook. So we're cross-platform promoting. We're encouraging people to go, you know, all over our channels. And that way they, they're aware of us and they can consume the content in the way that they prefer um, versus, uh, you know, just having one one channel out there. So there is the advantage of, of by being on all of it, you're able to communicate with a, a broader audience. Cool, cool. Thank you, Eric. I'll, I'll send that the link out, uh, urbanbeersman.com, uh, out to the audience. Um, so that that'll just about do it. I mean, we're at noon. Um, I guess if we if you have a question that um, you didn't get a chance to submit, uh, feel free to contact uh, us at CC Strategy at, at contact at cpcstrategy.com. Um, and if you have a question for Eric, I can pass it along to him. Um, I, Rick, Eric, you guys have any last last words? No, I just I just want to thank Eric. That's you know honestly one of the the favorite or my favorite presentations that we've done a, a joint webinar with, and and I was noticing on our attendee list uh, that everyone was staying tuned throughout the webinar, and so I think that just kind of speaks to the quality of the content that Eric was providing. So thank you, Eric. Uh, it's been a pleasure doing some joint marketing with you, and we definitely wish Beard Brand uh, the best of luck. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure uh, talking with, with you guys out there, and uh, hopefully you've been able to learn a couple things or two, and I'm always happy to help. So if you have any questions, uh, uh, just Google my name, and you can find me as well, or, or of course, go through John and Rick. I appreciate it, guys. Uh, have a good day, everyone.